This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Michael Scherer. Typee by Herman Melville. Chapter 25 Although I had been unable during the late festival to obtain information on many interesting subjects which had much excited my curiosity, still that important event had not passed by without adding materially to my general knowledge of the islanders. I was especially struck by the physical strength and beauty which they displayed, by their great superiority in these respects over the inhabitants of the neighboring Bay of Nukahiva, and by the singular contrasts they presented among themselves in their various shades of complexion. In beauty of form, they surpassed anything I had ever seen. Not a single instance of natural deformity was observable in all the throng attending the revels. Occasionally I noticed among the men the scars of wounds they had received in battle, and sometimes, though very seldom, the loss of a finger, an eye, or an arm, attributable to the same cause. With these exceptions, every individual appeared free from those blemishes which sometimes mar the effect of an otherwise perfect form. But their physical excellence did not merely consist in an exemption from these evils. Nearly every individual of their number might have been taken for a sculptor's model. When I remembered that these islanders derived no advantage from dress, but appeared in all the naked simplicity of nature, I could not avoid comparing them with the fine gentlemen and dandies who promenade such unexceptionable figures in our frequented thoroughfares. Stripped of the cunning artifices of the tailor, and standing forth in the garb of Eden, what a sorry set of round-shouldered, spindle-shanked, crane-necked varlets would civilized men appear! Stuffed calves, padded breasts, and scientifically cut pantaloons would then avail them nothing and the effect would be truly deplorable. Nothing in the appearance of the islanders struck me more forcibly than the whiteness of their teeth. The novelist always compares the masticators of his heroine to ivory, but I boldly pronounce the teeth of the Taipees to be far more beautiful than ivory itself. The jaws of the oldest greybeards among them were much better garnished than those of most of the youths of civilized countries while the teeth of the young and middle-aged, in their purity and whiteness, were actually dazzling to the eye. This marvelous whiteness of the teeth is to be ascribed to the pure vegetable diet of these people, and the uninterrupted healthfulness of their natural mode of life. The men, in almost every instance, are of lofty stature, scarcely ever less than six feet in height, while the other sex are uncommonly diminutive. The early period of life at which the human form arrives at maturity in this generous tropical climate likewise deserves to be mentioned. A little creature, no more than thirteen years of age, and who in other particulars might be regarded as a mere child, is often seen nursing her own baby, whilst lads who under less ripening skies would be still at school are here responsible fathers of families. On first entering the Taipei Valley, I had been struck with the marked contrast presented by its inhabitants with those of the bay I had previously left. In the latter place, I had not been favorably impressed with the personal appearance of the male portion of the population, although with the females, excepting in some truly melancholy instances, I had been wonderfully pleased. I had observed that even the little intercourse Europeans had carried on with the Nukahiva natives had not failed to leave its traces amongst them. One of the most dreadful curses under which humanity labors had commenced its havocs, and betrayed, as it ever does among the South Sea Islanders, the most aggravated symptoms. From this, as from all other foreign inflictions, the yet uncontaminated tenants of the Taipei Valley were wholly exempt, and long may they continue so. Better will it be for them forever to remain the happy and innocent heathens and barbarians that they now are then, like the wretched inhabitants of the Sandwich Islands, to enjoy the mere name of Christians without experiencing any of the vital operations of true religion, whilst at the same time they are made the victims of the worst vices and evils of civilized life. 
Apart, however, from these considerations, I am inclined to believe that there exists a radical difference between the two tribes, if indeed they are not distinct races of men. To those who have merely touched at Nukahiva Bay, without visiting other portions of the island, it would hardly appear credible the diversities presented between the various small clans inhabiting so diminutive a spot. But the hereditary hostility which has existed between them for ages fully accounts for this. Not so easy, however, is it to assign an adequate cause for the endless variety of complexions to be seen in the Taipei Valley. During the festival I had noticed several young females whose skins were almost as white as any Saxon damsels, a slight dash of the mantling brown being all that marked the difference. This comparative fairness of complexion, though in a great degree perfectly natural, is partly the result of an artificial process, and of an entire exclusion from the sun. The juice of the papa root, found in great abundance at the head of the valley, is held in great esteem as a cosmetic, with which many of the females daily anoint their whole person. The habitual use of it whitens and beautifies the skin. Those of the young girls who resort to this method of heightening their charms never expose themselves to the rays of the sun, an observance, however, that produces little or no inconvenience, since there are but few of the inhabited portions of the vale which are not shaded over with a spreading canopy of boughs so that one may journey from house to house, scarcely deviating from the direct course, and yet never once see his shadow cast upon the ground. The papa, when used, is suffered to remain upon the skin for several hours. Being of a light green color, it consequently imparts for the time a similar hue to the complexion. Nothing, therefore, can be imagined more singular than the appearance of these nearly naked damsels immediately after the application of the cosmetic. To look at one of them, you would almost suppose she was some vegetable in an unripe state, and that instead of living in the shade forever, she ought to be placed out in the sun to ripen. All the islanders are more or less in the habit of anointing themselves, the women preferring the aker, or papa, and the men using the oil of the coconut. Mahavi was remarkably fond of mollifying his entire cuticle with this ointment. Sometimes he might be seen, with his whole body fairly reeking with the perfumed oil of the nut, looking as if he had just emerged from a soap boiler's vat, or had undergone the process of dipping in a tallow chandlery. To this cause, perhaps, united to their frequent bathing and extreme cleanliness, is ascribable, in a great measure, the marvelous purity and smoothness of skin exhibited by the natives in general. The prevailing tint among the women of the valley was a light olive, and of this style of complexion Fayaway afforded the most beautiful example. Others were still darker, while not a few were of a genuine golden color, and some of a swarthy hue. As agreeing with much previously mentioned in this narrative, I may here observe that Mendanya, their discoverer, in his account of the Marquesas, described the natives as wondrously beautiful to behold and as nearly resembling the people of southern Europe. The first of these islands seen by Mendanya was La Madalena, which is not far distant from Nukahiva, and its inhabitants in every respect resemble those dwelling on that and the other islands of the group. Figueroa, the chronicler of Mendanya's voyage, says that on the morning the land was descried, when the Spaniards drew near the shore, there sallied forth in rude procession about seventy canoes, and at the same time many of the inhabitants, females I presume, made towards the ships by swimming. He adds that, in complexion they were nearly white, of good stature and finely formed, and on their faces and bodies were delineated representations of fishes and other devices. The old Don then goes on to say, There came among others two lads paddling their canoe, whose eyes were fixed on the ship, they had beautiful faces and the most promising animation of countenance, and were in all things so becoming that the pilot Mayor Quiros affirmed nothing in his life ever caused him so much regret as the leaving such fine creatures to be lost in that country. Footnote. This passage, which is cited as an almost literal translation from the original, I found in a small volume entitled Circumnavigation of the Globe, in which volume are several extracts from Dalrymple's Historical Collections, 
The last mentioned work I have never seen, but it is said to contain a very correct English version of great part of the learned Dr. Cristoval Suaverde de Figueroa's History of Mendaña's Voyage, published at Madrid, A.D. 1613. End of footnote. More than two hundred years have gone by since the passage of which the above is a translation was written, and it appears to me now as I read it, as fresh and true as if written but yesterday. The islanders are still the same, and I have seen boys in the Taipei Valley of whose beautiful faces and promising animation of countenance no one who has not beheld them can form any adequate idea. Cook, in the account of his voyages, pronounces the Marquesans as by far the most splendid islanders in the South Seas. Stewart, the chaplain of the U.S. ship Vincennes, in his Scenes in the South Seas, expresses in more than one place his amazement at the surpassing loveliness of the women, and says that many of the Nukahiva damsels reminded him forcibly of the most celebrated beauties in his own land. Fanning, a Yankee mariner of some reputation, likewise records his lively impressions of the physical appearance of these people. And Commodore David Porter of the U.S. Frigate Essex is said to have been vastly smitten by the beauty of the ladies. Their great superiority over all other Polynesians cannot fail to attract the notice of those who visit the principal groups in the Pacific. The voluptuous Tahitians are the only people who at all deserve to be compared with them, while the dark-hued Hawaiians and the woolly-headed Fijis are immeasurably inferior to them. The distinguishing characteristic of the Marquesan Islanders, and that which at once strikes you, is the European cast of their features, a peculiarity seldom observable among other uncivilized people. Many of their faces present a profile classically beautiful, and in the Valley of Taipei I saw several who, like the stranger Marnu, were in every respect models of beauty. Some of the natives present at the Feast of Calabashes had displayed a few articles of European dress, disposed, however, about their persons after their own peculiar fashion. Among these I perceived the two pieces of cotton cloth which poor Toby and myself had bestowed upon our youthful guides the afternoon we entered the valley. They were evidently reserved for gala days, and during those of the festival they rendered the young islanders who wore them very distinguished characters. The small number who were similarly adorned, and the great value they appeared to place upon the most common and most trivial articles, furnished ample evidence of the very restricted intercourse they held with vessels touching at the island. A few cotton handkerchiefs, of a gay pattern, tied about the neck, and suffered to fall over the shoulders, strips of fanciful calico, swathed about the loins, were nearly all I saw. Indeed, throughout the valley, there were few things of any kind to be seen of European origin. All I ever saw, beside the articles just alluded to, were the six muskets preserved in the tea, and three or four similar implements of warfare hung up in other houses, some small canvas bags partly filled with bullets and powder, and half a dozen old hatchet heads, with the edges blunted and battered to such a degree as to render them utterly useless. These last seemed to be regarded as nearly worthless by the natives, and several times they held up one of them before me, and throwing it aside with a gesture of disgust, manifested their contempt for anything that could so soon become unserviceable. But the muskets, the powder, and the bullets were held in most extravagant esteem. The former, from their great age and the peculiarities they exhibited, were well worthy a place in any antiquarian's armory. I remember in particular one that hung in the tea, and which Mahavy, supposing as a matter of course that I was able to repair it, had put into my hands for that purpose. It was one of those clumsy old-fashioned English pieces known generally as Tower Hill muskets, and, for aught I know, might have been left on the island by Wallace, Carteret, Cook, or Vancouver. The stock was half-rotten and worm-eaten, the lock was as rusty and about as well adapted to its ostensible purpose as an old door hinge. The threading of the screws about the trigger was completely worn away, while the barrel shook in the wood. Such was the weapon the chief desired me to restore to its original condition. As I did not possess the accomplishments of a gunsmith, 
and was likewise destitute of the necessary tools, I was reluctantly obliged to signify my inability to perform the task. At this unexpected communication, Mahavy regarded me for a moment, as if he half suspected I was some inferior sort of white man, who after all did not know much more than a typee. However, after a most laboured explanation of the matter, I succeeded in making him understand the extreme difficulty of the task. Scarcely satisfied with my apologies, however, he marched off with the superannuated musket in something of a huff, as if he would no longer expose it to the indignity of being manipulated by such unskillful fingers. During the festival I had not failed to remark the simplicity of manner, the freedom from all restraint, and, to a certain degree, the equality of condition manifested by the natives in general. No one appeared to assume any arrogant pretensions. There was little more than a slight difference in costume to distinguish the chiefs from the other natives. All appeared to mix together freely, and without any reserve. Although I noticed that the wishes of a chief, even when delivered in the mildest tone, received the same immediate obedience which elsewhere would have been only accorded to a peremptory command. What may be the extent of the authority of the chiefs over the rest of the tribe I will not venture to assert, but from all I saw during my stay in the valley, I was induced to believe that in matters concerning the general welfare it was very limited. The required degree of deference towards them, however, was willingly and cheerfully yielded, and as all authority is transmitted from father to son, I have no doubt that one of the effects here, as elsewhere, of high birth, is to induce respect and obedience. The civil institutions of the Marquesas Islands appear to be in this, as in other respects, directly the reverse of those of the Tahitian and Hawaiian groups, where the original power of the king and chiefs was far more despotic than that of any tyrant in civilized countries. At Tahiti it used to be death for one of the inferior orders to approach without permission under the shadow of the king's house or to fail in paying the customary reverence when food destined for the king was borne past them by his messengers. At the Sandwich Islands, Kahumanu, the gigantic old dowager queen, a woman of nearly four hundred pounds weight and who is said to be still living at Maui, was accustomed, in some of her terrific gusts of temper, to snatch up an ordinary-sized man who had offended her and snap his spine across her knee. Incredible as this may seem, it is a fact. While at Lahainaluna, the residence of this monstrous Jezebel, a hump-backed wretch was pointed out to me, who, some twenty-five years previously, had had the vertebrae of his backbone very seriously discomposed by his gentle mistress. The particular grades of rank existing among the chiefs of Taipei I could not in all cases determine. Previous to the Feast of Calabashes, I had been puzzled what particular station to assign to Mahavi. But the important part he took upon that occasion convinced me that he had no superior among the inhabitants of the valley. I had invariably noticed a certain degree of deference paid to him by all with whom I had ever seen him brought in contact. But when I remembered that my wanderings had been confined to a limited portion of the valley, and that towards the sea a number of distinguished chiefs resided, some of whom had separately visited me at Marheyo's house, and whom until the festival I had never seen in the company of Mahavi, I felt disposed to believe that his rank, after all, might not be particularly elevated. The revels, however, had brought together all the warriors whom I had seen individually and in groups at different times and places. Among them, Mahavi moved with an easy air of superiority which was not to be mistaken, and he, whom I had only looked at as the hospitable host of the tea, and one of the military leaders of the tribe, now assumed in my eyes the dignity of royal station. His striking costume, no less than his naturally commanding figure, seemed indeed to give him preeminence over the rest. The towering helmet of feathers that he wore raised him in height above all who surrounded him, and though some others were similarly adorned, the length and luxuriance of their plumes were far inferior to his. Mahavi was, in fact, the greatest of the chiefs, the head of his clan, the sovereign of the valley, 
and the simplicity of the social institutions of the people could not have been more completely proved than by the fact that after having been several weeks in the valley, and almost in daily intercourse with Mahavi, I should have remained until the time of the festival ignorant of his regal character. But a new light had now broken in upon me. The tea was the palace, and Mahavi the king. Both the one and the other of a most simple and patriarchal nature it must be allowed, and wholly unattended by the ceremonious pomp which usually surrounds the purple. After having made this discovery, I could not avoid congratulating myself that Mahavi had from the first taken me, as it were, under his royal protection, and that he still continued to entertain for me the warmest regard, as far at least as I was enabled to judge from appearances. For the future, I determined to pay most assiduous court to him, hoping that eventually through his kindness I might obtain my liberty.'